speak first, and then, um, as I said last time, one of you from each group will come up and give a progress report uh, where, where you're at, basically. Uh, so we can either do that um, maybe maybe in about an hour or something like that. Okay, so I just wanted to first uh, revisit something that we, we talked about last time, which was on this large-scale linear learning. And um, just to be the demo, maybe there were some points that were not super clear. So, the, so if you remember what we were doing was we were just looking at these squares, and we were just doing minimization of these squares. And there were two ways that I, mm. I discussed to do this. We could either do it in the batch way, or we could do it in the, in the online way. So in the, in the batch way, we sum over all the data points in our, in our training set, and then we do a gradient update. And in the online way, we would, each time we access a point in the data set, the training set, we compute like a gradient for that particular <coughs> data point, and then we do instantly gradient update. Well, there's a question a little bit about, you know, how does that converge? And so, let this, um, let's just run this. So this is going to be a two-dimensional weight vector. So it's, um, I think there are a few hundred training points. And I'm going to first of all show you the the online uh, updating of the two-dimensional wave vector. Okay. So this is um, this is it. That's very boring. Sorry, we should pull in somewhere else. So the, the thing to observe is that in the beginning, there were big jumps made in this uh, in this space, and now the the points are kind of slowing down. They're converging to, to something. So remember, each point here is represents a uh, a weight vector, too much a weight vector, and it's each point is is updated for a specific um, data point in the training training set. And we're cycling through these training points. So I think we've got to do training points like 10 times or something like that. So even though this is stochastic, this gradient descent, in the sense that we, you know, it's an online thing, actually this thing does converge. And, and the reason is that actually the gradients, if you remember from the, from the algebra, has a term something like, well, the least squares is say yn minus say W transposed uh, Xn squared, and the corresponding gradient has this as a, as a kind of a, a scalar prefactor. Okay, so the gradient for the data point Gn is something like this, it's proportional to that. But the point is that if, if you are in a wave vector which actually minimizes the squared error, this scalar term actually will be zero. So it doesn't matter what this is, even though you're sort of selecting this sort of stochastic, if you like, from a training set, this, this prefactor will be zero. So your weight optics will actually converge. It will be zero. Yeah? So that's what you're seeing here. This effect is that it's still going on, but it's, it's pretty much converged. Because the weight vector is close to zero. So that was the that was the discussion from last week. Okay. How do they, those two algorithms differ in terms of number of calculations made? Uh, they're the same. So mm -hmm. ultimately, the, um, uh, so if you do say say uh, i iterations of the batch mm. method, yeah, and you do i iterations of the, the online method.
then the total number of calculations is the same. However, the, in general, though, it may take a different number of iterations or calculations to converge, because you make these algorithms don't necessarily converge to the same point. Okay. So for these linear cases, it's fairly, those quadratic functions, it's fairly clear that they're going to be pretty similar. Yeah. Um, but there could be you know, situations where actually this sort of stochastic effect uh, that you get from the, from the sort of batch, for the online cage, could actually put you in a radically different solution than the batch one. Yeah. So it's not really easy to sort of say which one is you know, faster than the other one. Right. But, um, I think so. The, the the real point is that you don't, you know, if you don't want to have to, um, yeah. I mean, if sometimes you don't even want to have to store anything, so you just like this idea of you know making instant updates. And certainly, I think that one of the big advantages of the the online one is simply that this parallelization aspect is quite mm -hmm. nice. So also the synchronization is not a problem. Okay. So it's kind of robust to sort of synchronization issues in parallel variants. Right. That's the main. Okay, so let's see if we can move on to something else. Okay, so today we're going to be talking about nearest neighbors mainly. Okay, so I know that you know this already. Um, but maybe there's some things you don't know yet. Uh, maybe some things I don't know as well. Um, but we're going to talk about nearest neighbors. And OK, the first bit will be maybe to you. But I want to talk about ways that you can maybe speed up calculating nearest neighbors. And I don't believe you've, you've done this yet in your uh, courses. So um, you know, what would you do if you had, uh, say, you know, 10 million images and you wanted to find uh, the nearest image? to a query from a query in that 10 million database. That's not maybe something you considered how to do yet. Okay. So first of all, we're going to just rattle through some stuff that you already know. Uh, so what is nearest neighbors? Well, uh, you have a vector x, and maybe got some class label <coughs> c. So this is for uh, classification. And maybe capital C classes. And you can have a set of uh, n examples in your training data set. So we we'll call that. Uh, Sort of script D, um, and basically the point is that you want to, for a new X, uh, you want to find uh, the closest point in the state of sets and uh, assign that to the corresponding class. Okay, so yeah, you know, this is a prediction algorithm. So, what we're going to be exploiting in machine learning is the idea that somehow, if, why does how can prediction work? How could we possibly ever? get anything out of this, well the idea is that somehow there's a kind of underlying smoothness in some sense in the data. In the sense that things which are close together in the, the data space will tend to have a similar uh, class or a kind of similar label in general. If we don't have this, there's not really much you can exploit. There's no kind of uh, way machine learning can really, can really work. So in some sense, really all of the um, all of the techniques in machine learning are just different uh, ways of specifying similarity and smoothness. That's really the whole, the whole thing. They're just different techniques to do that. So the idea about nearest neighbors is that you know, that is directly doing that. It's very, uh, very intuitive and it's easy to program. And uh, yeah, it's simple. So you've obviously done nearest neighbors, right? And, well, you need to define what you mean by nearest. That requires some kind of distance. So you could look at, for example, uh, x and x prime the two different vectors. You could look at the square Euclidean distance, which I can write like this. So x minus x prime transpose x minus x prime. So again, you know, just in terms of notation, we could write that as x minus x prime square. So using this, this squared uh, distance, this will give you a kind of uh, partitioning of the data space. So this, but this is sort of this perpendicular bisector stuff, or this uh, Voronoi tessellation, which we've got the picture up here. So you've got some kind of, uh, in this case there are three classes, there are the red, green and blue classes, and these circles are the corresponding data points for those trained classes, and they partition the space into these sort of like little bits, these uh, sort of kind of tessellation. And these tessellations are formed from 
taking sort of two nearest neighbors here and sort of making their uh, perpendicular bisector, and then you kind of take the intersection of all of these perpendicular bisectors, and that forms this tessellation. So that means that if you, for example, come along with a new point, you know, and it's here, it will be assigned to the blue class, and so the new point here will be assigned to the red class. Okay. So this is nice. Um, there are some, you know, limitations with this, but this basic it doesn't really take into account you know, the way that the, the sort of the data is distributed. You know, you might have data kind of like that you know is sort of lithium on some kind of particular kind of low dimensional manifold, and that's not really captured by this. Um, you might have some things where maybe you know the length scales are varying dramatically, and that wouldn't really be captured by this. There are some ways to kind of get around that. So one thing that you might want to do is look at this Mahalanobis distance. I don't know, did you do this in the, in your supervised learning? Uh, Example. So this is a classic thing that you do. Um, so the Mahalanobis distance essentially says, well, um, let's look at the, the data from all classes, and let's first of all calculate the covariance matrix. And this is, gives you, in some sense, the kind of um, uh, direction of locality or distance in different directions. So in other words, you know, if the if the data is spread sort of uh, you know, like this. Then the distances in this direction are smaller than the distances in this direction. So that means if you use nearest neighbors, essentially this distance here would actually dominate the distance calculations, and that may not be appropriate. So you may wish to rescale in some sense the, the data. But you don't want to just rescale it, sort of, you know, uh, if the data is axis aligned, then you can just do a simple uh, rescaling of each data point. But if the, axis is, the data is not axis aligned, then how do you do the rescaling? Well, one answer is to use this covariance matrix to do the rescaling. Okay, so if the data all lay like this, you could say, well, actually, you know, really, I want to kind of like compress this data, rescale it, so that it's essentially iso isotropic. Okay, so it's going to be like a, big, a uniform distribution. There's no particular sort of direction to follow. And that rescaling can be done by uh, this thing here. Okay, so essentially, uh, this is the covariance matrix from your training data, and so the inverse covariance matrix then gives you this kind of like uh, isotropic uh, scaling. Okay, is that um, is it? So is this? Um, you should recognize this actually is something that's looking similar to multivariate Gaussian somehow. So yeah, and if you want to actually just transform that space instead. Yeah. How would you do? Would you decompose the inverse matrix? Yeah, so uh, that's what that's just that's actually where it comes from. This is this sorry, this is the idea of uh, what's called whitening. I don't know if you've heard that term. Okay, so a whitening transform is one that essentially makes data which is not unit covariance, zero mean unit covariance, it transforms it to a zero mean unit covariance uh, space. So I'll try to explain that. So this is the classic thing that you do um, with your data prior to any analysis. So let's look at um, let's look at right. so something called uh, well let's let's call it century. So let's say you've got a, a set of data points, okay. and you want to make a new uh, data point, say, set n, or a new collection of data, uh, data points set n, such that this has got zero e. Okay. So in other words, the sum over n of set n is equal to zero. So the other way to do this is to say, well, Zn is equal to Xn minus mu, where mu is equal to mu. Then this Zn is uh, clearly going to have 0 of mu. So sum over n of Zn, sum over n of Xn minus n lots of mu. Is, this is going to be um, uh, that's correct. Yeah, so 
this is equal to n times my mean. So that's the first step. Now, for whitening, what we like to do is to say that the empirical covariance is a density matrix. So in other words, that sum over n of Zn, Zn transpose. I'm going to assume it's already been whitened. Okay. It's already centered. Okay. I mean, we like this to be equal to a density matrix. So I'm going to assume it's already been centered, so I can assume it's got zero mean. So this would be, this is the, for a zero mean data, this is the condition that the um, empirical covariance matrix is identity. So let's, let's think about this. Let's say that um, sigma is equal to whatever n, that's sum over n of xn, xn transpose. Okay, so somebody gives you this matrix here, and you want to make a kind of transformation, say z n, which is single sum matrix n times by each x n, such that indeed you know z n, z n transposed sum of n, one of n is equal to the density matrix. So the question is, you know, what is the what is that matrix then? Inverse? It's not quite the inverse of sigma. So let's one way to, to, to see this is to say, well, let's just plug this requirement of this transformation here into this requirement. Okay, so we get one over n. Sum over n, so Zn is equal to n, xn, uh, and then this is the transpose of that, so that would be n, xn transposed. And you want that to be equal to the identity. Okay, so you can pull out this uh, m here on the left, and we can pull out the m transpose on the right. So this is the same as 1 over n, n times by uh, sum over n. this thing here, this is just sigma. So in other words, m sigma m transpose is equal to the density matrix. That's the requirement. So the question then is, what should m be in order that? So if I give you sigma, what's the suitable setting of m to satisfy that? Eigenvalues, the matrix of eigenvalues. Yeah, yeah. You you need to. It's, in some sense, it's kind of like um, a square root or inverse square root. Right? If this were a scalar uh, equation, right? You'd say you know m squared times by sigma is equal to one. So m is like one over the square root of sigma. That would that would do it, right? So you want something intuitively like a square root, an inverse square root of a, of a matrix. So you need to define a matrix M such that M um, Oh, because it's symmetrical, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, if you like. So if you can define a matrix um, let's say in general, say sigma to the half such that Sigma is symmetric, so we want this is sigma to the half times by sigma to the half is equal to the density. So this would be, this is the definition of the square root, sorry, this is the definition of the square root of a, of a matrix. So if a matrix, you know, you take uh, the square root and you multiply it by itself and you get the matrix, that's a, a definition of square root. Okay, we'll, we'll We'll come back to how to calculate such a quantity in a second. Okay. So if you've got this, um, 
And similarly, sigma to the minus a half times by sigma to the minus a half is equal to sigma to the minus one. So that's an inverse square root. So let's say, check out, what if you said m to be equal to sigma to the minus a half? Well, you get sigma to the minus a half times by sigma after sigma to the minus a half. But sigma is equal to sigma to the half times by sigma to the half. <coughs> So this is the identity, and well, that's the identity. So it's the identity. Okay, so what you, the setting here, so m is equal to sigma to the minus a half, is the one that you want. Okay, so that's the, that's the transformation. So there are different ways to define um, inverses, or sorry, square roots, or inverse square roots. It doesn't really matter. If you've got the square root, you can get the inverse just by taking the inverse of that square root. So that's the identity. So how do you calculate such a such a matrix? So if I gave you sigma, um, so it's, let's say it's uh, symmetric, uh, how would you calculate that quantity? The eigenvalue decomposition. Yeah, yeah vector exactly. Time stuff. Yeah. Right. So the eigenvalue decomposition would, would be one way to do it. You could use SVD. That would be another way to do it. Right. So you could say, um, let's say that sigma equal to us to be transposed, but this is symmetric, u is equal to v, so if you like that. Okay, so this would, uh, this would be the sigma value decomposition of sigma. So if you define sigma to half to be us to half u transpose, so remember s is a diagonal matrix, so it's clear what we mean by the square root of the diagonal matrix, it's just a square root of its diagonal entries. Then sigma to the half that's my sigma to the half would be equal to u s to the half and transposed to u s to the half and transposed. And because it's orthogonal, that's the identity. The square root of uh, the diagonal times by square root of the diagonal is equal to s. So we are. Uh, So you can do a similar thing for the eigen decomposition. It's the same. And there are, there are other ways to do it as well. But that's, uh, that's perfectly fine. OK, so, so the point is that you can string all this together. And you can say, well, um, if I've got a set of data, so this is uh, the total thing is that you, you just say, well, OK, for for data at n, I form a new data set, say Zn, where I just take uh, x n minus mu, and I take sigma minus a half. That's my value, where, yeah, mu is as we defined before the empirical mean, and this is the inverse square root of the empirical covariance of x. Okay. And this has the well, property that it's zero mean and it's, uh, it has isotropic covariance, unit empirical covariance. So it's, uh, it's got unit covariance. So what that means is that this data, so if the x were kind of you know, distributed like that, maybe that's some, um, you know, that's your coordinate system, you've got a mean over here, here and it's sort of distributed like that in the x space. In the z space, you can look at the different, it's going to be somehow distributed around the origin, zero, and it's going to look roughly spherically distributed. Okay, so this is kind of nice because it means that, you know, the length scales uh, are kind of all equal, potentially, so there's no preferred uh, direction. That's the kind of useful thing. So what you'll often find is that people, when they do machine learning, you know, they, they often just apply these winding transformations uh, immediately to the data in order to get rid of any kind of length scale. So the question is then, you know, what is if, um, you know, if you think about this in this transform space, the general data point x and its corresponding transform z, um, what is the Euclidean distance going to be? Well, essentially the Euclidean distance is just z squared. Um, yeah, let's say. Um, 
can see we've got two data points there and Z prime. So the distance between these two is then by a set prime squared, okay, which is going to be uh, sigma minus a half x minus mu minus sigma minus a half x minus mu prime squared. Okay, so this is the the distance now. Between the two data points in the transform space. Okay. So this um, we can you know simplify a little bit. Obviously, this these constants here are going to disappear. So this the same. Uh, so we're going to get essentially that sigma to the half, you know, minus half um, x minus x prime uh, squared. Which is sigma to the minus a half. This is transpose. Take that to half. Sigma to x minus x primes, which is x minus x primes. Sigma to the minus one. And this is our this is our Mahalanobis distance. So that's, that's where it comes from, basically. You have to like linear algebra trying to do machine learning, basically. I guess that's one of the bottom lines. Yeah, so, okay. I don't know if you knew this uh, widening transform. It's a very standard thing to do. You know, so if you think about it, it's the kind of it's a generalization of um, a rescaling of the of the inputs, right? So what you might think of doing is that if you had a, a vector which is say got you know component components x one, x two, x three, you know, and this one is um, in millimeters and this one is in meters, and they're measuring something on the same length scale, then you know this one is going to dominate this one <coughs> in terms of distance. It's going to be much bigger generally. Than this quantity here. So, you know, we talked about this a little bit before, like, you know, you could do a rescaling of this thing for the gradient descent, because gradient descent is not invariant with respect to these kind of order transformations. So, um, so, the obvious thing to do would be to take this one and make it such that this quantity over all of its data points has zero mean and unit, and unit variance. But that's a kind of uh, thing to do. And similarly for this one, independently, you can do that. But that's does not sort of get around the rotational, doesn't shear this data. Yeah. Um, could you use kernel methods instead, potentially? Kernel methods instead? Yeah, so rather than look, so it's just basically a dot product. Yeah. Just take a, a kernel map. Yeah. Yeah, I think You can, yeah, you can think about centering it in the, um, in the kernel space. That's possible as well. Um, people do that kind of stuff. It's a bit more tricky, actually, to do, but I think it's, uh, it's doable. Yeah, anyway, so that's, uh, that's, 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 that's where this comes from, the Mahalanobis distance. Okay, that would be a very nice exam question, actually. How could you write that? Okay, um, so let's think about some good and bad things about nearest neighbors, okay? So the, the bad thing is that you need the whole data set, you need to run through every data point in your data set in order to make a, a new specification. So you come along with your new X and you have to compute its distance to all of the data points in your training data set. So this is quite expensive if you've got you know, lots and lots of training points, you maybe you know, it takes a long time just to run through that linear calculation of all these, uh, you know, all these distances, so that, that seems to be you know, pretty, pretty bad. Um, so one way to, to get around that is that what you can do, and this is a little bit tricky, but essentially you can think about 
if you think about that picture that we had before the Voronoi tessellation, you could imagine that you could potentially remove some data points and that tessellation would not change significantly. In other words, you know, the coloring of that space into its classes would be very, very similar to what it was before. So this is called data editing. Um, so you can just remove you know, a subset of the training data such that the Voronoi tessellation is uh, not changed too much. Okay, so that's one thing you can do. Um, we're going to talk a little bit later today about other ways so that you can potentially speed up these uh, distance calculations, exploiting some geometry of the, of the space. And we'll look at the two cases. We'll look at metric spaces, and we'll look in particular also at um, Euclidean uh, spaces. Okay. Um, so these are really very powerful methods that are used a lot. Um, but are important. Another way to speed things up is that, well, maybe you don't just want to have to avoid calculating all the distances in your data space. It could be that actually computing a single distance even is very expensive. So you, maybe if you think about Euclidean distance, it's not that expensive. Right? It takes order d or d, the dimensional space, to compute the Euclidean distance. But there could be other distances which are much, much more expensive to compute. So maybe they come from something else, you know, like a, some complicated model gives you a measure of distance between two objects. And it takes a while to compute that sort of calculation, um, or to compute that distance. And then maybe you want to avoid doing that somehow. And we'll talk about other ways to do that as well. Even, sometimes even the Euclidean distance could be too much for you. If you've got a huge, uh, maybe images are pretty, pretty big, right? You might say, well, you know, images that could contain a million pixels easily, right? So if you want to do uh, nearest neighbors with a million pixels, um, Maybe that's too expensive just to compute this Euclidean distance. So one thing you can do there is to say, well, actually, I could uh, project these high-dimensional data points x down to some low-dimensional data points say p, and this Euclidean distance is going to be roughly approximately given by the distance between the corresponding projections. Um, that should be reasonably intuitive, but we could prove that if you want. It's in the notes, if you want to. Remember, these are all just um, summaries of the notes, right? So if you want to find that uh, sort of description, it's in the notes. Yeah, I think it's clear, right? It's probably pretty clear. But um, is this, is, this is the best um, approximation to the squared Euclidean distance that's possible under the projection. Okay, so there are other things that are you know, not very clear. It's not sort of obviously what to do with missing data, or you know, how would you com incorporate some kind of prior domain knowledge with uh, nearest neighbors. So k nearest neighbors, this is something that you've, you've done before as well. So if your, uh, you know, your nearest neighbor is a little bit flaky, maybe you don't want to trust their opinion too much, right? So maybe you want to um, you want to take some more neighbors into, into consideration, right? maybe the sort of the combined opinion of your a few neighbors is better than uh, potentially the opinion of just one. So uh, that's good. It can make the um, decision boundary somewhat smoother. And so the, um, the picture for this is like that. So you have a point here in the middle. That's your, uh, your query point. You need to find the nearest neighbor to this query point and the classes of those. So in this case, the um, the red square is the nearest neighbor, so potentially, potentially you would say the, the class of the black dot I'll make as red. Uh, but if you include, say, you go out with this hypersphere until you hit, say in this case, three nearest neighbors, so the, in that case we've gone to here, and then we take the majority class of the neighbors within that hypersphere. Yeah. Wouldn't that be expensive to the computation to expand that radius, that sphere, and look at stuff? Um, yeah, I mean, you, you don't you don't actually do the expansion like that. You simply, you know, you've got, um, because you know what these points are, you can simply say, I just compute these distances uh, to all my data points, and I just order them. And then I take the, <coughs> the first three in this one. That's a matrix um, you don't need a matrix, you just need, say, so you've got your query point here, you've got then a vector of uh, distances to the n data points. Okay, so you compute, so in other words, you know, you've got this one here, you compute a distance, 
another data point here, you compute a distance. You compute all the distances. That gives you then a, a list, essentially, of distances, and you, you sort that list. But that's, it's order n, of course. Now that's expensive still to do. That's cool. um, and then you need to find, uh, in this case, the three nearest on that list. So, um, yeah. You're right that I think maybe your, your question is more to do with, you know, could you somehow do I'm something smarter? Yeah, yeah, like, yeah. yeah. I think you could do that, but that, that would be expensive. Yeah. yeah. Um, for the single neighbor thing, um, you can just record the boundaries of the regions. I mean, for the Veroni thing. Yeah, but that's expensive the, as well. The boundary is very complicated. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. I don't think. I mean, there's a one-to-one -one mapping between the boundary and the position. I think of the the, the Aurora tessellation itself. So I don't think you 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 sort of gain anything by actually. Actually, is that true? It's not true, let's say. It's not a one-to-one -one mapping. You, 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 you could, you may, you, maybe you're right. Maybe you're right. It could be that it's cheaper to do that. It could be cheaper. Um, I don't know. So well, maybe the way to do it, though, would be like the data editing. Right? You could sort of... Um, Interior points get rid of Yeah, I, mean, I think maybe another... I think my first... So for a Vorano tessellation, there does exist a unique... There does exist a an equivalent positions of data points that would uh, make that form of tessellation for your readers. Um, so, in other words, uh, yeah. really dumb uh, case to start with. So these are class uh, X, red X, and these are blue X, and these are class, say, <coughs> red circle. So the, um, in this case, the boundary would be, would be here, right? So your intuition is that actually you don't need, well, you know, the data editing intuition in this case is that you can get rid of any of these those two data points, right? Or you could have done the other ones, you know, you could have got rid of those two and kept those two, it would be the same. Um, so I, it's true that you could somehow do data editing and then either you're left with you know, these single points are still, or equivalently some representation of where this thing starts and where it ends. But I think what I was trying to say is that where that starts and where this ends is equivalent to just storing these two positions here. I don't see any advantage in that, actually. I think the tricky thing is, I'm not sure how computationally easy it is to figure out. I mean, I suspect it's like an NP-hard problem to figure out the optimal data editing uh, sort of case in order to do that. I can't think of a minute that that would be easy to do, unless somebody has a better idea. But uh, it's not clear that that would be easy. Okay, so how do you choose this? Okay, well, you could use cross validation. Right, so that's, uh, that's good. Um, here's some examples of uh, handwritten digits and some zeros on the left, some ones in the middle, and some sevens on the right. And in the training data, this little example can have, I think, 300 examples of each of these digit classes. Okay, and so we're gonna we're, we're gonna first of all say try to compare you know a one versus a seven. So in other words I give you the training data set now for the ones and training data for the sevens. I want to do binary classification in the sense that I come along with an image, I want to know if this image is a one or a seven. Okay, that's the uh, sorry one or a zero. And um, in this case I'm gonna look at um, I think I don't remember how many neighbors I use actually. I think I just do the nearest neighbor here. Yeah. So in this case, the, the nearest neighbor, so this, oh yeah, so the first thing to say is these uh, images are 784 dimensional vectors. And essentially, for all of the test points, there are 600 of them, you can perfectly classify the data. Okay, so 
this is a very easy problem. So the, this one here, the ones versus the zeros classification problem, is actually pretty pretty easy. And I think the reason is is obvious that you know zeros in some sense don't look anything like like ones, right? <laughs> They're kind of uh, pretty, pretty different. Uh, yeah, I guess some people could write a pretty bad pretty bad zero. Um, but this one, ones versus sevens, actually this is a little bit uh, more difficult. So in this case, for the 600 test examples, you make 18 errors using those labels. Um, so this corresponds to about a 3% error rate for that. And what's the reason for it? It's pretty obvious that sometimes you know ones look a little bit like sevens. Um, so you can't see this very well, but this seven here, you know, is not that great in terms of sevens. Uh, it could be a little bit, and this one here, you know, I don't know, that could be a one. Right? So it's much more difficult. And the point is that there is, you know, when you're looking at distances, that this this vertical bar here in the sevens is very similar to vertical bars or sloped bars in the ones. So a large part of the, the sort of the two images is very similar. And that's because you're just looking at these distances. That's going to give you a very high similarity. So just out of interest, the actually the you know the world's best algorithms for for doing this are pretty amazingly accurate actually. So over all the ten classes, not just the binary classification problem, they you know they do better than the average human could do. So if you take your standard human off the street and ask them to do this, uh, they do worse than the best machines could do. So that's pretty pretty impressive. So, yeah. Yeah, I should say, by the way, this isn't the, the, the best algorithms. They don't use uh, nearest neighbors. They use all kinds of other stuff. So support vector machines can do quite well. Um, these sort of neural network style things are quite, uh, quite good as well. So I mean, this is a big kind of you know, interest, uh, so a big area for driving research in machine learning. Okay, now something you may not have done um, in the past is a probabilistic interpretation of nearest <coughs> neighbors. Have you done this? No. So, what I'm going to say here is that essentially you can think about, say, nearest neighbors as equivalent or similar to what's called a Parson estimator. So, what this is is you basically place a data point. For each data point, you place a Gaussian distribution which is centered on a data point with some covariance, uh, isotropic covariance matrix, sigma squared i. So for data from class 0, so for 0, 1, uh, 2 classes, you'll make this generative model of the 0 class data by putting this essentially mixture of Gaussians over the, of the space. Okay, so we get a Gaussian bump every data point in the class 0 data. And we do the same kind of thing for the class 1 data. Okay, so we put bumps for over centered on each of the training points now. Mm -hmm. This defines two generative models for the class the class conditional generative models. And then for a new data point, say X star, you know, what is the probability that X star is in class zero? Then we can use this Bayes rule to, to do that calculation. And the only thing we need to define is well, what is the a priori probabilities of the two classes? Well, if we were going to do this by maximum likelihood, we would just set the probability a priori to this class zero just to be proportional to the number of times in the training data that class zero uh, gets relative to the total number of training points. So you might say, well, um, you know, if you're going to do maximum likelihood training, uh, this is like NC mixtures, so don't you have to learn these things, right? But actually, we're not. We're fixing them here. This is a the diff distinction between a Parson estimator and a standard mixture of Gaussian. So we are simply placing the training, if you like, is simply to place these Gaussians over the centers, of the, over the data points. There's no parameters there. The only thing that we will possibly tune is the width of this basis function. Yeah. You just like density estimation? Yeah, it's essentially, it's like the world's simplest density estimator. Um, you just smoothing essentially the empirical distribution by placing Gaussian bumps there instead of delta spikes. Um, so 
So this is one way to do classification, and I'm going to try to argue that this is essentially uh, a generalization of uh, the nearest neighbor approach. OK, so in this case here, we've got, say, four uh, red classes. And then the, these dots here are the, these points. And these, say, here are, say, the one standard deviation contours of the corresponding two-dimensional Gaussian, and here is the corresponding three um, blue class points, and then you come along with a new point here, and you want to know what's the probability of that, say, that new point being, say, class uh, a blue class, right? Okay, so what I'm going to try to just say, and if I do it on the next slide, is that as we take the limit of these uh, width of these Gaussians to become very, very small, that the class of this uh, black dot will be assigned to the nearest neighbor, the class of the nearest neighbor. Right, so we can look at this. So yeah, just to say, first of all, that um, the corresponding maximum likelihood setting for the priors uh, to PC c equals zero is just the number of times that class zero appears uh, relative to the total number of data points. Uh, some of the p plus equals one is n one uh, the number of data points. So what is the so p of c equals zero given x star? <coughs> the posterior probability that we're going to class it this way divided by the probability that we classify as a one. So if this if this ratio is bigger than one, then we're going to say classify the state point as uh, zero. If it's less than one, we'll classify it as plus one. Okay. So just um, using base rule, we're going to get equivalently this. Okay. So um, yeah, this kind of like uh, expression doesn't contain this sort of annoying normalization constant. So that's uh, it's uh, more useful. Now let's look at this expression. Okay. What happens to this expression as we take sigma to get pretty small? Well, you have to think a little bit now. I could write this down mathematically, but um, maybe you can, you can view it in, in your head. So what's happening here is that this is a mixture of Gaussians. Okay? And they're all um, centered on the training data points. So you want to know what's the This is a, a new x star. Okay? And so if you, go, if you think about this, you've got a sum of squared exponentials. So you can have something like e to the power minus x star minus x n squared divided by sigma squared. So if sigma is very small, that term, if x n is not close to x star, this e to, the e to the minus thing will be super small. This will essentially be zero. Right? Because you're going to have something of the form e to the minus x star minus xn squared over sigma squared. So if the sigma squared is very small, if this is non, not zero or close to zero, <coughs> this thing here will be huge, it will blow up massively. E to the minus something massive is essentially zero. Okay, so this means that all terms here, as you go along in the sum, the sum over the training points here, are essentially zero except for one point which will be exponentially larger than any of the other points. Namely that point, xn, which is closest to x star. All the other points will have vanishingly small contribution relatively. This point, this value here could still be very small, even for the nearest neighbor, but it's exponentially larger than anything else. Okay. And um, a similar thing happens on the denominator. Okay, it's going to also be dominated by that uh, point which is closest to the particular um, for, for class one, the, the x which is closest to x star. So in that sense, what's going to happen then is you're just left with a single exponential here on the numerator. And so this mixture actually collapses to a single point. And similarly, the mixture on the denominator collapses to a single point, namely the corresponding uh, Gaussians which are closest by. So you've got an exponential on the top, square, divided by an exponential on the bottom, square. Okay. So 
essentially this, if you're just now looking uh, at which of, if this ratio is <coughs> one, these exponentials don't matter. You just need to know now which, is, which exponent is, is higher. Okay, and the exponent then which is higher is the one which has got the, near, the nearest neighbor. So that's essentially the, the sketch uh, of why this uh, reduces to nearest neighbors. You see that? Yeah. Okay, and um, the derivations in the in the notes if you want to to think about that in more uh, detail. But this is kind of um, it's kind of nice because it means that essentially you know you, if you don't well, the idea of you know k nearest neighbors is to take into consideration more than one nearest neighbor, the, the class over here. Um, but you can think about this, you know, this method here also does a similar kind of thing, right? Because now, if I go back to to here and I use a kind of a Gaussian which is not limiting uh, this small width, essentially I'm going to be thinking about the the influence of data points from other classes potentially. So if these gases were really big, the influence of all data points would start to come into account. If I took it infinitely big, actually all data points would count. And simply I would classify uh, the black dot as just that class which is the most numerous in the, in the whole training set. Right. So this is a kind of more um, graceful way, if you like, of interpolating between the nearest neighbor case when sigma is zero and the sort of the infinite neighbor case when we just take the most numerous class. So this is a, it's a like um, k nearest neighbors, but it's a little bit uh, smoother in some sense. Okay, so you can do this to more than one class. It's very uh, two classes. It's easy. You know, you just put a, if you've got n classes, you would just put a uh, well, say, let's say k classes. You put a uh, this part an estimator. You do it for each class. That would be the corresponding thing to do. Um, of course, you could say, well, you know, this um, this parser estimate is really not a very uh, good generative model of the, of the data, or not a very good sort of um, estimator of the, the, the data density. Uh, I could use something much more sophisticated. Of course, you could, right? You could use um, whatever you like. It's your favorite density estimator, and that's the, for example, a mixture of Gaussians, where you might say change the position of the, the means, or you might do some kind of low dimensional manifold searching. Um, and then you'd just be you know, using this base rule to do the classification. Okay, so this is um, this is nice, but there's a problem with nearest neighbors, and there's a problem with this actually as well. In the sense that they are they are not going to give you a reasonable answer uh, in many cases. And one case is that so imagine that you've got uh, training data. And you've got a test data, which is a long, long way away from your training data. So, so let's imagine all your training data is down here. Um, let's say one class, and so maybe you have another class, say. <coughs> Perfectly nice train data, but then you have some kind of wacky problem where somebody comes along and says, "Well, look, I would like to know what is the class. I want to classify this new point here. So, what's the class of that new point according to nearest neighbors? Red. It's red, right? Um, so this one here is the it's a little bit less than this distance here. Do you have much confidence in that? No, right? Because this is not the situation where you would expect to be, have any confidence at all. Because the, you know the whole thing that we we expect is that you know we get good generalization. We hope to get reasonable generalization, but we um, we need the the test points to be from the same distribution as the data was generated, the training data was generated. Clearly, this is not really that situation. So this is kind of bad, right? We would sort of make this, you know, absolute sure decision that it's the red class, even though we should not really, we should not really do that. And a similar situation would hold for the, um, 
the case that we, we did this probabilistic interpretation, we might put, say, some <coughs> mixture of Gaussians around these points here, right? And some of the glue passes as well. And we'd ask what's the probability that the green, the new point here, belongs to the red class. And uh, it's going to be one. So the point about that is that the probability that this, um, this red data point here generates this green point is very small. Right? It's exponentially small, actually. The probability that this blue point generates this green point is exponentially small. However, this is, this is exponentially smaller than this quantity here. So in other words, let's say this distance here is uh, 110. Okay. The square distance is 110. And this distance here is 100. So in some sense, you know, roughly speaking, this first one here, the probability that this, um, you know, when you do this ratio, you're going to have e to the minus 110, so uh, minus 100 for the, this class here, divided by e to the minus 110, roughly speaking, right, for say, you know. So they're both really small, um, but this one is e to the minus 10 bigger than that one. Which is, you know, so it's exponentially more likely. Even though you really shouldn't have any confidence at all that this should be exactly the case. So this is bad, right? It's bad news. So you go along there, you know, you you have this nice probability model or the uh, k nearest neighbors or whatever whatever you like to call it. And somebody comes along with a uh, you know a new data point and you say, um, I'm absolutely sure that this is class one. Let's say uh, you don't have any deaths, but I know it's, it's exponentially likely that it's class one or class zero. It seems pretty, pretty silly to me. Right. So how how can you get around that? Wait to, to wait the distances. Could wait the distances. Yeah. Um, Could you create three classes? What's the third class? That dot. <laughs> 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 um, <laughs> it, no, it would just have a different prior, wouldn't it? So it would be like a different distribution, but less frequent. Well, I like your suggestion, but um, what we could do is something similar to that. I think that may may work, but. The, the third class uh, you could have is say, um, you could say make a third class which is say centered on say the mean of your training data that has huge bearings. Right. So what would happen in this case is that you would say that third class would be likely to generate this green point more than any of the other two. So you might say, well, that's an outlier class. Like that. You could do that. Yeah. That would be one piece of um, there's something else you can do, though, which is a little bit uh, similar, but I prefer. Um, so we're only going to have two classes, not three. Any suggestions? The boss? you to do this, to sense your classifications are nonsense. You get the problem, right? I mean, it's like, a, it's a real problem, right? So, you know, you could say, I have a training set of cats, and I want to, you know, I have a new cat image, and I want to see which cat is the closest cat to this cat. <laughs> and, I, um, I don't have a solution, but I have a way out to detect it. Okay. So maybe, which, uh, if we would just add more neighbors, uh, the class would change all the time. It would switch from one to two, and if we would detect this kind of switching, mm. we might get cautious about it. 
you could do that, but that seems to me that seems to be a property of the kind of lo local thing. Yeah, and, you know, you could kind of like rearrange it in any way you like, but you still have the same problem. I think so. I'm not sure that that would help. Could you like, have just like a linear classifier, just a line through the, the split? Because it it could be that the data it would make sense with respect to the data. So you mean so if, like it, if those were classified like malignant cancers, yeah, and um, on one axis you had the amount of cigarettes you smoke in one day, yeah, and um, it would make sense that if that dot on the far right was red yeah. and red were malignant or yeah. something, it may be, it makes sense. Mm. No, I'm no, no, sorry. No, no, no. On the it's like suspicious. Is your, <laughs> uh, I just want to clarify: is your problem that it's class that like gets the ratio is way too high, like you want to just have it like the ratio much smaller because yeah. What so can we just take the log of it? That won't help because um, this is, this is what it is, right? So if you take the log, you know it's still going to be, well. I mean, that would be a different model. Yes, yeah. well, you know, it wouldn't be near as neighbors. Um, but you're right that what we want is this ratio for this kind of situation to be closer to half. Yeah. Oh, so we don't have which be to be closer to one. In other words, we don't have a clue, you know, which is the first Yeah. So when you do this density estimation, you put a normal distribution down around each trade point. Mm -hmm. What if on top of that you put like a small uniform distribution for each data point? They're basically like on the extremities. It would basically just classify it as the more dominant class. So if there are more of the blue class. It would just classify the blue class. So the further you got away, the normal effect would decay, and then it would just be the uniform effect across the whole yeah. space that would dominate. You could do that. Absolutely. That's the, um, essentially what I had in mind. Or a slightly, a slightly simpler thing you could do is just do just use one additional Gaussian with a very very broad variance for each class. So in other words, you you could take the blue. You say let's say you, you compute the mean of the whole data. Okay, so you say. Um, Maybe this is the mean of all the data points, independent of the class. Okay. And then you could say add a, a Gaussian, I'm not going to draw this very well, but you know, with a really big variance here. Something that's you know sufficiently big that it kind of nothing really could um, well any, any data is going to be likely to be generated by such a Gaussian. It's not going to work. And then you do the same thing, so that so you add this big Gaussian to your blue mixture model, and you do the same thing for the red. You take the same mean, and you have the same big component to the mixture for that class. Okay. So what's going to happen now is that you come along to this point here. The pro all of these points here have essentially zero probability under this mixture model. So when we think about that sum, this uh, all these terms here are getting killed, basically, because they're so far away. Except for <coughs> this Gaussian here, the blue one, the big one, he's going to have something like, um, he's going to have a term e to the minus the mean of the whole data minus x star squared over this big sigma squared. Well, sigma squared is uh, this big sigma here. And um, the same thing is going to happen for the denominator for the other class. It would just be because the mu mu is the same um, and the sigma square is the same. So there's going to be you know something very small plus this, and something very very small plus that. And these very small terms essentially become zero as you. Actually, move out from this data space. So, this thing will then actually become essentially one, which is what you want, right? You don't want any. Well, you could argue that you you might prefer um, to make the class that of the most numerous points. Personally, I I wouldn't make that interpretation just as you you know your your method would have done. Simply because I want to say that. I'm so far away from the data that I, I don't want to make any statement anymore about it. Yeah, I'm, totally, I'm maximally un un uncertain. Um, although that's a, you know, that, that's a debatable viewpoint. So that's what I, I personally 
for it to do. So this is um, a practical thing that you know you, you should think about doing whenever you do uh, Gaussian mixture modeling or these probabilistic uh, sort of interpretations of English things. Yeah. Just a question if we would have used uh, the Mahana with distance that you talked about before yeah. um, to evaluate the learning distance from the two points, they would be also, their also, the ratio would be also plus yeah. one, right? Um, no, wouldn't plus, to, wouldn't plus to one, because remember the Mahalanobis distance is is defined by the, the training data covariance, right? So, so but if you, we would recalculate it for a new point, of course. Yeah, but it doesn't work like that. So the Mahalobi distance is calculated for the training data, not for the test data. So you, um, yeah, you can't sort of um, take the test data point and then recalculate everything. That's not the way it would work. So you just take the training data and then you calculate Mahalobi distance and you use that then to do the classification. Okay. Um, I mean, your, your point is kind of. Um, you, know, you, you could think about say, well, if I start to get more points like this, you know, maybe, and I get the class labels, and maybe you start to recognize that you know there is some weird geometry going on. You need to sort of take that into consideration. Um, but yeah, I think in, in some sort of standard sense, you know, we're just going to take the training data and understand the geometry of that. Yeah. But um, ultimately, the algorithm is still going to classify the points. Whether if it's slightly above one or slightly under one? No, it won't. It won't. Well, because what will happen is that, well, think about it numerically. So this term here is exponentially small. Okay. So this means that the number in, in a computer, the number of bits that you, you know, you're going to try to represent this is enormous. So your computer says this is zero. Okay. So there's no, there's no difference between this zero and this zero. So this is ten. This is ten to the minus a thousand. Mm. This is ten to the minus a thousand two. They are both zero in, in any computer. So it doesn't matter. And even if it <coughs> were not, these two here are one essentially. If you like, there is some mm. constant number. Let's say order one. It doesn't really matter what what it is. Um, it's exponential, so it's going to have one. You know, plus, um, say, you know, some constant, uh, I'll call it one, it's not one, but it's a constant, it's of that form, right? But this could be epsilon, or it could be, you know, two epsilon, whatever it is. And the limit that epsilon goes to zero, this ratio still becomes one. So I should say it's some constant, k. Okay. So is it sort of like an outlier class? Um, that's what I was. It's yeah. It's not that. You know, that was. Uh, it's all the a sort of not confident. Um, class. it's not. It's not equivalent to that actually. Um, but it's it's similar in spirit. Um, <coughs> the only thing I should say, by the way, is that you might be worried that introducing this this extra class is a little bit weird. What I should have said is that. The weight that we associate with a class is going to be very small, so we'll have a prefactor. So normally, you know, these points here in the mixture model they've got unit prefactor, one over actually one over n prefactor, where n is the number of training points. But this fictitious additional one, we'll give it a very low weight, say some epsilon. So in other words, we add on um, so the p of data from say class zero. We've got this sum of so our original data points, right? So uh, n equals one to n, whatever, from class zero of this Gaussian, uh, with some sigma squared. And then what we'll do is we'll add on some, say, small thing, say, delta amounts of um, this big like mean. Let's say mu and some huge covariance. Let's call it say um, c, right? The c is really big, and then we'll just make it such that this thing is normalized. So what's the what's the normalization term here? C 
So it's going to be 1 over z here, where z is the normalization term. You have to tell me what z is equal to. So that would be a correctly normalized distribution. So the point is that this delta is something small. You know, so let's say 0.01, something like that. So this term here, for any, for any data point x, which is kind of close to your training data xn, x star, which is close to any of the xn, this kind of term is going to be you know, appreciably large. But because of this delta term here, um, this will be very small. It will be you know, an order of two orders of magnitude smaller. So for any point x star which is close to your train data, the contribution of this sort of fictitious Gaussian is, is negligible. It only plays a role when we, we're in this situation here. So it has no kind of um, obvious negative consequences on your, your k nearest neighbor, or your, your nearest neighbor or half of them. I think if, if you make a variant big enough, I mean, it's going to be so thinly spread anyway, isn't yeah. it? You don't even have to, you have to include that delta because it's going to be so thin across the surface that like, the, yeah. the likelihood is going to be so low for it. You could do that, but anyway. the only problem with that a little bit is that, um, I mean, that may be equivalent actually, but the s slight tricky thing is we have to worry a little bit about numerical uh, stuff, you know, because basically we don't want this term to be totally zero, so we have to kind of like e to the minus a thousand is going to give us a problem. So we need to worry a little bit about how to represent that in a computer. I mean, so we want it to be small, but we don't want it to just like get binned by the by the algorithm. So the other thing to say is that of course when we do this, you know, when we evaluate this, these sums of these experts, this will totally fail. Uh, you know, you cannot you cannot do this implementation naively. It just won't work uh, because you you instantly run out of uh, bits on the computer. You have to do which trick do you gonna have, have to use? The logs on X, right? So without the logs on X trick here, you're you're dead. Basically. So it's impossible to do this. So you need to evaluate both the numerator and denominator in that ratio with each with the logs on X trick. Yeah. So how will this point ever get classified ultimately? This point here, it would say that um, well, this ratio would be 1. So it would say either class 1 or class 2 have got to 0 for class F, and 1 class of equal probability. So it would be maximally so it wouldn't classify it basically? Yeah, it would say I have no clue. This is so we're not solving problem. the problem then? Um, <laughs> well, um, there is no, the point here is that there's no, there's no reasonable solution to this problem in the sense that, I, well, I'm trying to argue that the only reasonable thing to say is that <coughs> there is no, nothing in the training data to suggest either way. Okay. And I think that's, you know, that's the most reasonable thing we can, we can come up with in this case. I think it's unreasonable to, to suggest anything else, personally. So it's basically an outlier detection. Yeah, it's it's um it's an outlier detection. You could say that. Um, but it's a kind of it's kind of an automatic built-in thing in the sense that you might you know you could, it's a very simple mechanism to add this thing onto your your classifier and then you can kind of you know put it out in the wild and not worry too much about whether or not you're going to get you know, completely stupid uh, results for you know being overly confident in, in kind of like stupid cases basically. So. It's just kind of like a, a mechanism that you you, know, you just plug it into your, your classifier. Um, so there are you know there are similar th kinds of things that you can do for other kinds of classification methods as well. And it's important to do this in, in, in practice. Uh, if you've got some real automated procedure where you're just you know, classifying things all the time, and you're not even you know you're not even personally analysing them to see whether or not it makes any sense or not. Yeah. No, you had another question. Or? No, it's yeah. fine. So I think. I think it's, gosh, it's already half past three. Crikey. Um, I think we'd better have a break. So, 20 minutes.